All right, good morning. You may be seated. And uh, we are going to continue Genesis chapter 17, and we made it to verse 1. And we've been in verse 1 for what, two weeks? <laughs> and uh, you ever have God just put a verse on your heart and you just can't get past it? You got to keep staying. Today we're going to stay in Genesis chapter 17, verse 1. Why don't we turn there really quick? God is doing amazing things in our midst. Who was here last week? Let me see your hand. All right, so you know that God has put it on the, the heart of the board to begin looking for a church home. And I do know this, that we're not going to move until God moves us. Uh, and I don't want to be uh, have this burden on the church of a lease or all of that, but God is beginning to provide every need. Uh, it's interesting, I told you all to take your bulletin and invite a family to church every week. So you have that cool bulletin that we got printed up. Take it with you and invite a neighbor, invite a friend, invite someone to church. And so the other morning, we have prayer every morning at 7 a.m. To, to pray about what God is doing in our midst. And on the way there, I was going to make coffee instead of going to Starbucks. And the Lord said, no, go to Starbucks. I'm so glad he told me that. And I was like, yes, <laughs> I'm like, oh, Lord, I don't want to go to Starbucks. I want to get early to prayer and make coffee and, and really start praying uh, for the needs of the church. And uh, I just really felt compelled to go to Starbucks. So I'm like, which one do you want me to go to? And he's like, Lowe's. I mean, it was that quick and that, that clear. So I go to Lowe's and I get out of my truck and I'm walking in. He goes, go get the bulletin. And I'm like, oh, my Lord, have mercy. I forgot. So I go back to my truck. I get a bulletin out. And uh, so I go on Starbucks and I'm in line and I'm like, okay, Lord, who is it? Who here do you want me to invite? And, you know, I didn't feel compelled to talk to anyone. So I ordered my coffee and I was going to just leave the bulletin on a table there. And I'm walking out, and he goes, turn around and go back by the bathroom. And there was uh, some seats back there that I couldn't really see, it kind of around the, the corner thing. So, okay, so I go back there, and this guy goes, hey, you're a pastor, right? And I go, yeah, yeah. So we start talking, and um, he goes, yeah, my wife and I are going to be uh, looking for a new church home, and I'm a general contractor, and, you know, uh, if your church you know, ever needs, like to build out some classrooms or whatever, I could do it. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. Now, when you think about it, I had no plans to go to that Starbucks. And God made me go there and hooked us up with a contractor who, if we do get a building, is going to be on board to get everything done, the code and uh, all of that stuff. Isn't that cool? Yes. The other thing is, you know, is all the city planners in this whole region and he goes if you have a hard time getting a cpu cup conditional use permit hey i know all the guys and uh, the mayors and i can probably help get you one isn't that awesome yeah not that awesome okay awesome. so and then i get a call from a guy at church and he's like hey what, you know uh, we've got all this church stuff pews everything for a church we just want to give it to you and I'm like, really? Awesome. You know, so we're, we got all excited. And then he called back and said, oh, uh, the board wants to sell it to you. <laughs> right? So, but I do know this. To, to get all the equipment a church would need is like $20,000. We're talking pews and all of that stuff. And uh, there's another guy that um, we're going to have someone look at it on Tuesday as pews that would seat like 300 people, that would be, you know, about $18,000. And we might get them all for like 2,000 or less. Awesome. Isn't God good? Yeah. So God is doing some amazing things. And last week in Genesis 17, verse one, we talked about God giving Abram his side of the covenant. And let's just read it again. I believe it's important to revisit this before we continue on. By the way, what? What is next week? Father's Day. Father's Day. 
And uh, yeah, you gotta come to that, you know, because all the guys get something cool usually, like a nail or a rock. You know, isn't that cool? <laughs> 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 uh, it, it is funny. The women get roses, the guys get, you know, like rocks and hammers and tools, who knows what. Now, when Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless. If you remember last week, we talked about literally what that meant. The idea is to walk before God is to live your life in the presence of God, knowing that wherever you go, he's with you. That you can't escape his presence and he's always with you wherever you go. He wants to be included in our lives. And the second one is to not compromise, be blameless, not sinless, totally different. But to be blameless, not to have a compromised walk. We talked about how the enemy really wants to isolate you from God. You ever feel isolated from God? Yes. Like your prayers aren't really reaching God. They're just bouncing off the ceiling. And you open the word of God and it doesn't come alive. It doesn't really speak to you. That's one of the enemy's tactics. And he will do whatever he can to isolate you from God. To destroy your prayer life. To get you to compromise in every area of your life. And today, we, I really want to talk about how do we fight this fight? This spiritual battle. Because that's been the tactic of the enemy from day one. By the way, we have prayer tonight at our new office. If you need directions, see me after church. 5 p.m. And it goes from 5 to like uh, 7, 6.30. Something like that. So, uh, And we have sign-up sheets. The, uh, Hey, John, while you're up, do you want to grab those sign-up sheets? We need to pass those around. I forgot. One is for the potluck coming up in two weeks, I believe. Yeah, pass that one around. And another one is for the men's breakfast coming up at the end of the month. And uh, we also have church directories now, new ones. One per family. And make sure your information is correct before you leave today. If it's not... There's a sheet over there where you can correct your information. And if you're not in the church directory, fill out your information on the sheet so we can get you in the directory. All right? Let's pray. Father God, I thank you, Lord, that you love us. And Lord, I pray that your word would be anointed as it goes forth today. God, that you would truly engage our hearts. Father, that we would leave here refreshed, encouraged, and strengthened, God, to live for you in the week ahead. Lord, we pray for a potential church home. God, we don't want to move unless you direct us, God. So we just believe that if you intend for us to be in a building, and I believe you are leading us in that direction, then God, I pray that you would open up the right one, that we would see your miraculous hand bring provision and bring the location, God, that's conducive for us to minister in Saddleback Valley. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, God spoke to us and many people over and over saying battle is coming. It's interesting that throughout the New Testament, most of the encouragement is how to fight the good fight, how to be victorious as Christians. We do know this, that the armor of God, and it's a study we've done many times, is necessary to be victorious in your walk with God. If you compromise any area of your life, it's essentially taking off the armor, the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness, all of those things. Two weeks ago, we talked about covenants. And we talked about all the covenants that God has made with mankind. Who can remember all those covenants? What's the first one? The Adamic, right? Then the what? Noitic. Then the Abrahamic. We just put... X on all the things so it sounds good. <laughs> and then we have the Newick, the New Covenant. You know, all of these covenants up, oh, the mosaic, all of them. Satan is all about getting you to break covenant with God. If you're married this morning, Satan is all about getting you to break covenant with your spouse. If you're a child this morning, Satan's all about getting you to break covenant with your parents. 
You know, I believe that he is doing whatever he can to get us to break covenant. Now, if you notice the three signs God has given us as covenants, uh, Genesis 9, 18, God put a rainbow in the, in the sky and said, this is the sign of the covenant that I'm making with Noah. But not just Noah, as you read that text, it's for the whole world, all mankind. You know, Satan's really trying to uh, take advantage of this sign. What does the rainbow mean today? It means the same thing to me. For us, it means the same thing, but for the world, when they see a rainbow sticker, what do they think? Of? Homosexual pride. Satan has taken the first beautiful covenant that God made with mankind. I will put my bow in the clouds. This is a sign of my love that I'm not going to destroy the world with water again. I love you, and Satan has done his best to take that covenant. Jacob was in Hollywood uh, for his birthday, and he sent me a picture of a Methodist church with a gay pride banner outside the church with the big rainbow on it. Isn't that crazy? What about the sign of the next covenant, circumcision? Now, obviously, uh, now it's not in the flesh, it's what? In the heart. And we're going to talk about that in a couple of weeks. But what does Satan do with this sign, the, the cutting of the way of the flesh and holiness? He begins to say, you know what? You don't need to be holy. You don't need to do anything. Just believe and then live your life as you've always lived it. You see, I believe when you're born again, a transformation takes place. Amen. So that sign of circumcision, you can't even find it in the church because no one is teaching holiness anymore. It really takes away that holy blamelessness that we should have. We should carry ourselves in such a way that people look at us and say there's something different about him. There's something different about her. They have this love, this joy that emanates from them, this strength that no matter what they face, wow, they have this awesome strength. And then the last sign of the covenant, the new covenant, is the blood of Christ. And what Satan has done with that is made it where most churches today, well, not most, but many, never mention blood. You know that. They never mention sin. It, it, they become so seeker sensitive that they don't talk about the necessity of the blood of Christ. Jesus said, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no part. You see, I believe that the church has turned that into legalism or secularism, but they all point back to the covenant that God made with Abram. And that covenant was literally, walk before me, live your life in my presence, and be blameless. Satan's doing the same thing today. He, from that moment on, began to try to get Abram to break covenant with God. Now, remember when we talked about cutting covenant? When Abram cut the animal in half? Remember God the Father, symbolized by the oven, and the torch, symbolizing Jesus Christ, walked through the parts. They are the parties, so when we break covenant, Christ pays for it, not us. Aren't you glad of that? He wants us to be so busy, and I don't know about you, but life has become extremely busy for me. Anyone in the same situation? I mean, it's like I try to downsize and get things off my plate and the more I do that the more things come and I find myself from early in the morning till late at night running trying to keep up with all the busyness of life you see I believe the enemy will get you so busy and so frazzled that you don't have time to get into the Word of God the more busy you get let me encourage you it is worth your while to get into the Word and into prayer every day and walk with God throughout the day. Because when you do that, He gives you strength. I'm so busy that I can't imagine not starting my day in prayer. You know that prayer meeting we're doing every morning at our office, 7 a.m. If you can make it, join us. We pray for a half an hour. If you can't make it, Maybe you're commuting, you're driving, maybe you're home or whatever it is. Try to pray for the church. 
Try to pray for where God is leading us because I believe he's going to be doing great things. He'll try to make you so worldly minded that you don't even try to be holy. But folks, the fact of the matter is we have a very real enemy that's trying to destroy your life. You know, I do a lot of counseling, and as a chaplain for the fire department, I get paged out often. Not real, real often, but pretty often. And when I'm paged out, most of the time in this OC bubble that we live in, guess what I'm paged out for? Yes. Suicide. Either attempted or successful. And a lot in Ladera Ranch amazingly because people have all these expectations and everything they have and they get to the point where they feel like they can't go on folks i gotta tell you this the enemy is real and he's trying to destroy your spiritual life first and once he does that he will try to destroy your physical life as well I believe that it's time that we really strap on the armor and begin to fight. Turn to 1 Peter chapter 5. Let's get into the Word. Man, I'm so tired of rambling up here and you're tired of hearing me. <laughs> 1 Peter. Uh, after Hebrews, after James, chapter 5, starting at verse 6. Just before it, and any time you come across the word therefore, you have to go back and see what it's there for. And he says this just before it, For God is opposed to the proud, verse 5b, but gives grace to the humble. You know, in America, we're raised to be proud, right? Look out for number one. We need that pride and pride in school, and we learn that, and we don't like the term humility. But humility is what? How do I define it? Strength under control. Strength under control. It's not, hey, walk all over me. Hey, woe is me. It's strength, but it's under God's control. Amen? Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you at the proper time, casting all your anxiety or worry on him because he cares for you. We need to pause for a moment on that verse. Cast all your worry, your stress, your anxiety on the Lord because He cares for you. Isn't it amazing that the Creator of the universe knows you by name? Amen. He loves you. You can't flee from His presence. He has a plan for your life. Cast all your care upon Him because he cares for you. Be sober of spirit. Literally, don't be under the influence of worldly philosophy. Don't be under the influence of anything but the Holy Spirit and the Word of God. Be sober of spirit. Be on the alert. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. If you've ever been in the depths of depression, you know exactly you've come face to face with this enemy. If you've ever been in the depths of anxiety or stress or on the verge of a nervous breakdown, you have come face to face with the enemy. And I can assure you, he is trying to destroy your life. First, by breaking covenant with God, by isolating you from God. Because the minute he does that, the fruit of the Spirit won't be found in your life. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, all of those things. Verse 9. Here's the first step we do in battling him. But resist him, firm in your faith. Faith in the armor of God is what? Shield of faith, right? That's how you block the fiery darts of the enemy. It's bulletproof. To bring it in modern vernacular, it's like you have a shield that a bullet cannot penetrate. You're completely protected, and it's faith. 
Folks, if you trust God with your life, no matter what happens in your life, it's not going to phase you because you're fully trusting a mighty God that's going to carry you through that situation. Resist the devil. You do that also by taking every thought captive. To what? What does the rest of that verse say? Take every thought captive to obedience in Christ. It's interesting that faith and obedience go together. That if you profess faith in Christ, you begin to want to obey His Word. Does that make sense? And the more you do that, seeking first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, the more you do that, the more His blessings pour into your life. The more He carries you through the trials and difficulties and battles in life. Resist Him. Firm in your faith, knowing that the same experience of suffering are being accomplished by your brethren who are in the world. And after you've suffered for a while, the God of all grace, aren't you glad of that? Who called you to his eternal glory in Christ will himself perfect, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. Any trial you're facing, if you run to God and you trust God in the midst of it, he will strengthen and establish you. You will grow in your walk with the Lord. If you find yourself in battle this morning, know this. You want to memorize this verse and just talk about it and think about it. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 57. It says, but thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. We used to sing a song when I was a kid. Victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. Who knows that song? <laughs> Quite a few. Good. He bought me and taught me with his redeeming blood. He loved me and I knew him, and all my love is to him. I don't know why I sing it country, because I grew up in a little hick church. You know, I can, I'm going to get an accent here in a minute. You know, Where's my cowboy hat at? It's <laughs> So how goes the battle this morning? Let me ask you that question, point blank. Do you have victory in Jesus Christ or are you being trampled upon and losing the battle? And how do you know if you're losing it? Everything is falling apart in your life. You see, when the enemy comes in, the Bible says he comes in like a flood. So usually it's not just one thing. My hot water heater broke. You know what I do when that happens, right? I look up and I say, God, you got a big problem. Your hot water heater broke. Because <laughs> it's not mine. I'm just a steward. Everything I have is God's. Amen? Amen? And so if my car breaks down, oh, did I say my car? Lord, you got a problem. Your car broke down. You got to get this fixed. You know what? He cares. We're stewards of all that stuff. You do have victory in Jesus, but the battle that we're in is so serious that failure to recognize that you're in a battle as a Christian will make you complacent, mediocre, and compromised, and the power and love and fruit of the Holy Spirit will not be evident in your life. You will live your life in the flesh. You will be driven by circumstances rather than allowing your faith to drive circumstances. Does that make sense? The most often used analogy in the Bible for Christians is soldiers. The terminology in the New Testament, every letter is about literally military terminology. Stand firm and don't lose ground. Endure to the end. Overcome in the name of Jesus Christ. I really believe that it's time for Christians in these days to strap on the armor of God. This church, as we move forward, I can assure you battle will come. Being a part of the church where you become family and an integral member of the body of Christ is extremely important in the days ahead. 
because society will increase its attacks against Christians. We're living in enemy territory. You ever think about that? I mean, this world is truly not our home. You know the not in this world stuff? Yeah, you got a sticker on your car. I saw it. It's cool. Some people have it. We're truly not in this world. We live in enemy territory. We are ambassadors of a different kingdom. Some of us are strange just by nature. <laughs> And some of us are strange because we're born again. But I do know this, we should all be strange. This world is not our home. And note this, many Christians are so compromised they're not even in the battle. If you meet a Christian that's just floating through life, no battle, no struggle, no anything, number one, I can tell you this. They're not a threat to the enemy. Right? Because if they were... They would be in what? Battle. So many Christians, the, the thermometer of their faith is, the easier life is, oh, must be, I, I'm doing okay. I must be really godly because life is so easy. But the minute you commit your life to Jesus Christ, you enter this battle arena, and folks, the solid Christians, all, all of them throughout the Bible, went through intense battles. I don't find one that was just comfortable. You know, well, hey, I got my house. I got a great job. I've got my 401k. Ah, oh, life is good. No, you find the guys like Paul in, in the Bible who went from one battle to the next, from one beating to one imprisonment to one you-know-what all throughout his life. So if you find yourself in battle this morning, first of all, I'd probably say probably headed in the right direction because we are soldiers we used to sing another song onward christian soldiers who knows that song <laughs> onward christian soldiers marching as to war with the cross of jesus going on before anyway i won't sing sorry jake I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, right. I'm sorry for me singing. No, he's sorry that you had to hear that. So, <coughs> First Corinthians sixteen thirteen. It's up there. It says, "Be on the alert." Military term. Hey, be on guard. Stand watch, because the enemy is out there. You're in enemy territory. He is coming for you. If you find yourself in respite from the battle right now, praise the Lord, run to God, because believe me, battle will come. And it's only through His strength that we can be victorious. Stand firm in the faith. Again, not only is it a shield, but here it's a rock. And what is our foundation, our rock in which we're planted when the storms of life come? Jesus Christ. Act like men. Be strong. I like the act like men. What does it mean? Hey, even though you're scared, man up. Act like a man. Does that make sense? Yes. It's kind of like when we would take our son to an expensive restaurant. And we said, all right, when we're in there, act civilized, Cody. <laughs> you're not civilized. I know that you are what you want to throw food and do all this stuff. You are not civilized, but act like it. Are you with me? So here the idea is, even though you might be scared, even in the midst of trial, you might be like, wow, how are we going to get out of this? Because of who we are in Christ, act like a man or a strong woman, you ladies, right? Be strong in the Lord. Jesus' first statement to the church. If you know it, I'm taking you to lunch this week. <laughs> uh, one of his first statements to the church, about the church, really, he said this. We're a great army that's under attack from Satan's fortress. 
And in Matthew 16, 18, he says, the gates of hell will not what? Overpower or prevail against the church. It's inferring that Satan's kingdom is expanding. You see, gates only move when your kingdom expands. Does that make sense? And he says, really, in the last days, Christian, you're going to be loved by the whole world. No, he doesn't really say that. He says, in the last days, you're going to be hated by all nations. So it seems like the kingdom of the world, Satan's kingdom, is expanding, but we knew it was coming. Look at all these ideas about last, time, last days. Jesus said, when I return, will I find faith in the earth? In Timothy, he says, in the last days, difficult times will come. Men will be lovers of self, boastful, arrogant, revilers. It says, in the last days, men will be haters of good. Have you experienced that? I've experienced it. When I'm talking to people and I say, this is what the Bible says. That's an offense to God. They say, no, God's an offense to me. That book is an offense to me. You ever hear people say that? <laughs> women will burn with desire for other women and men with men in the last days. You'll be hated by all nations. The love of many will grow cold, Matthew 24. You know, it's amazing to me, uh, John Kudla was a good friend of mine in Bible college. He used to come to this church, him and his wife. The enemy came in, split them up. And he's the sheriff reserve officer whose son nearly beat to death over here in Robinson Ranch not too long ago. John loves the Lord. Some of you remember John and his kids. We came here. Are we fighting a real battle? Let me tell you this about John. He was a mighty man of God. He loved Jesus. His wife loved Jesus. His kids came to church and loved Jesus. But the enemy came in like a flood, split their marriage, and caused his 17-year-old son to nearly kill him. And he's still in an induced coma. Folks, that is exactly the battle we face. Do not let the enemy split your marriage. If you find bitterness coming up in your heart toward your spouse, you need to get help. And I'm not talking about counseling. You just need a mediator. Sometimes that, that's all it is. But don't allow this division to continue to the point where it splits up, your home's destroyed, and your kids who love Jesus all of a sudden turn the other way, like what happened to John. Please pray for him, by the way. He's still at uh, Mission Hospital, and I think, uh, I think he's still in an induced coma. Has anyone heard? Did you hear about this? Event? Yeah, I can find out too, yeah. So. All right. We're in a real battle. But in Matthew 24, it says, verse 12, the love of many will wax cold, and that's in the church. People will so be about just building their own kingdom rather than building the bride of Christ that there's no real Christian love. There's no real uh, helping one another when, when things happen. The war that we're in... Uh, Guys, we need warriors. Girls, we need warriors. If you've ever fought the fight and been victorious, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Now, I'm in a unique position because I've literally seen demonic forces and been a part of casting them out of people. It is weird. And I can assure you this, when a child raises up against a parent, trying to kill that parent, this is the work of Satan. When someone gets to the point where they don't want to go on, this is the work of Satan. He wants to destroy marriages and destroy your life. And we 
need to fight. Ephesians 6.12 says, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood. Note this, your parents are not your enemy. Your children are not your enemy. Your spouse is not your enemy. We here are not your enemy, even though you might be challenged with some of us. Your enemy is a spiritual principality. It's powers and authority in heavenly places and the rulers of darkness in this world. It's demons and Satan himself. That's who we're fighting. This war is not a war fought on foreign lands. You know, in Israel, they grow up with war, preparing for war. So if you ever go there, they've got soldiers on the streets. They're all ready for the next terrorist attack. They're ready for battle. They're watching. They're, they're vigilant. In America, when it comes, we're, we're not ready for that. We've never had real war. I mean, not since the Civil War on our land. But the enemy, I can assure you, is trying to destroy you and your family. We fight against him. The proximity of that war is here and now. It's not a future thing. If you're not in the battle, I can tell you this, you're probably not right with God this morning. Now, if you're in respite from the battle, different thing. Aren't you glad that God gives us retreat from the battle sometimes? But if everything is going good, get ready. Battle's coming. Be ready to fight the good fight. The nature of this war is primar not primarily physical, but the enemy can attack there. Remember Paul had that thorn in the flesh, right? Could even be, he said, a buffeting spirit. Interesting. That kept him humble. Huh. The intensity of this war is a life or death battle. The word wrestle in, in the passage we just read literally denotes hand-to-hand -hand combat. And folks, every time you're tempted and you don't fall, but you're tempted and you have the opportunity to make a choice, that's battle. And you need to make the right choice. The arena of this battleground is really our heart and our mind. It seems that the enemy loves to play in the emotions. You ever just out of the blue get angry and all of a sudden you're so mad you don't know why? That happened to you? <laughs> or you start feeling blue and you don't know why? Fiery dart from the enemy. Shield of faith stops it. Take those thoughts captive. All of these are military terms. We're in a huge battle. We need to fight the good fight. The minute everybody is born, I believe Satan does his best to keep them from coming to God. For those of you that came to God older in life, I can probably imagine you can think back when you knew God was trying to woo you and draw you, that you were so wrapped up in the world you just ignored it. So God was always protecting you and drawing you, and the enemy was always trying to divert you and isolate you from God. Sometime, though, you surrendered. You gave your heart to Jesus Christ, and things began to change. The minute you become born again, the enemy is trying to get you to break covenant with God, to isolate you from God. And that's why it's so important that we press into the Lord. God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. I say that a lot. On the flip side, Satan hates you and has a terrible plan for your life. <laughs> and I can tell you this. When you do seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, everything begins to work out in your life. Amen. You begin to be victorious in battle. I really believe that God is looking for a people that will carry the cross, that will proclaim the word of God, that will worship in spirit and in truth, that will fight the good fight. I don't know where you find yourself this morning, but I do know this, God's plan is better than your plan.
Because the minute you're doing your plan, guess whose plan you just adopted? Satan's. And I can assure you this, it will lead to destruction. If not financial destruction, at least the destruction of your soul. God's plan is so much better. He just is looking for a people that will run to Him. Amen? Turn to Hebrews chapter 3, and we're going to close with this. Starting at verse 6. says this, but Christ was faithful as a son over his house, whose house we are if we hold fast our confidence and boast of our hope firm until the end. Are you confident that God loves you? If not, let me tell you today, God loves you. There's nothing you can do that would make him not love you. Not a thing. Boast in our hope, firm until the end, verse 7. Therefore, just as the Holy Spirit says, today if you hear His voice, do not harden your hearts as when they provoked Him, as in the day of trial or battle in the wilderness, where their fathers tried me by testing me and saw my works for 40 years. Therefore, I was angry with this generation and said, they always go astray in their heart. And that is what the enemy is trying to get you to do. Sunday morning, man, I'm going to serve God this week. I am going to get up, I'm going to pray, I'm going to be in the Word, and the enemy will always get you to go astray in your heart and isolate you from God. Verse 11, As I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Continue on. Take care, brethren, that there not be in any one of you an evil and unbelieving heart that falls away from the living God. That's exactly what the enemy is trying to get you to do. But encourage one another day after day, as long as it is still called today, so that none of you will be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. For we have become partakers of Christ if we hold fast the beginning of our assurance firm until the end. Therefore, or while it is said, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart. I believe this morning, come on up worship team. God is wanting to strengthen and encourage and equip you for the battle. If you find yourself losing that battle, today's the day to get armored up. We call our office the armory, by the way. I just love that. <laughs> Have a couple of swords hanging on the wall. That's kind of cool. For the guys. You know, girls are like, yeah, whatever. We'll put flowers in there. Okay. What song are you going to do? What song? So this morning, if you find yourself in battle, first of all, well done. It means you're probably headed in the right direction. If you're not in battle, maybe God has you in a respite, a season of refreshing. Keep running to the Lord in the midst of that season. Battles come, battles go. But the whole thing is we always need to be armored up and ready. Book of Nehemiah chapter 4. I would encourage you to read the story. The king sent Nehemiah Artaxerxes to rebuild Jerusalem. And all the families were there building a place, really God's house. And they all had a trowel in one hand. What did they have in the other? A sword or a spear. 
Because their enemies were all around trying to stop the work that God was doing. And let me tell you this. First in you personally, God is trying to do a work. God has called you for a lot more than just mediocrity and just cruising through life. He's got a plan and a purpose and a calling on your life. And you need to be ever vigilant. Going about your business, but at the same time having your sword in your hand. Because this is how we fight. When I'm depressed, I run to the Psalms. This is how I'm comforted. When I need encouragement or wisdom, I'll go to Proverbs. I, if I just read a story in here, God always speaks to my heart. Because this word is living and active. And it is our sword. This morning, I really believe that God would have us say, you know what? I'm going to fight for my family. I'm going to fight for my life. I know the enemy is trying to destroy me, first spiritually, then relationally, and ultimately physically. But I'm going to fight the good fight with the strength that you did. This morning, God wants to move. Heal marriages. Heal your heart. Bind up the brokenhearted. And strengthen you to give you everything you need to face the challenges of the week ahead. And as this church moves forward, battles come. It's time for us to do what they did in Nehemiah chapter 4. I would encourage you to read it, maybe this afternoon. I don't understand. With heads bowed, nice clothes. You're here this morning and have never surrendered your heart completely to Jesus Christ. This morning, the Lord Jesus is knocking on the door of your heart and He's saying, Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. If you've never surrendered your heart to Christ and you're here this morning and want to do it, would you just look up at me? Maybe you're here this morning and you know God. Man, you can remember a time when you walked with God in the cool of the day. That life was fresh and new because all of a sudden you realize the creator of the universe, God Almighty, loves you. And that Jesus truly paid for your sins on the cross of Calvary. But something happened. You got distracted. You got sucked into the world and you've been far from God and this morning you want to say you know what God I'm ready to come home Lord I need I need you I miss those times with you if that's you this morning would you look up at me God bless you God bless you God bless you Father God we come before you as a humble people Lord, we're all sinners saved by grace. And Lord, this morning, I pray that you would cleanse us and forgive us. That you would wash us, Lord, in the blood of the Lamb. God, that you would fill us with your Holy Spirit and give us strength, Lord. God, I pray that you would show us what it means to put on the armor of God. And Lord, I pray this week we would walk with you. We would be always aware of your presence and your leading and guiding and strengthening. And Lord, I pray that you would give us a heart and a desire to be pleasing to you, to be obedient children. And Lord, I pray whatever battles people are facing this morning, I pray, God, in Jesus' name, that they would find their victory in Jesus Christ. Lord, that you would give them victory in this battle and respite from the battle and a season of refreshment, Lord. And Lord, help us always to be ever vigilant, to go about our day, but to always keep our sword in our hands, ready to fight the good fight. In Jesus' name, amen. If you need prayer, we'll be over here. God bless you.